Hi, this is Tipo Irie. My name is Maccabi, the Grasterman Maccabi. My name is Sandra Cross, and welcome to Echoes, Echoes from, from the, the Island. Island. See ya. Yes, I am. <laughs> It's called Wolverhampton in the West Midlands in England. Jamaican parents, yeah, they came from a place called Hanover in Jamaica. And they came to England in the 50s. They came, they are part of the so-called Windrush generation. Came to England to work. And their plan was to come to England, work money, and go back to Jamaica and live in Jamaica big Caribbean, West Indian, Jamaican community in Wolverhampton, you know, and most of them came from Hanover in Jamaica. So I had a lot of family in Wolverhampton and we grew up like Jamaican, you know, we walk Jamaica, talk Jamaica, eat Jamaica, listen to Jamaica music, you know, so it's like a little Jamaica in Wolverhampton. The music person who influenced me the most was my friend's father who had a sound system and we lived like four houses away from it. So I'm about four or five years old and I'm sleeping and I suddenly hear this boo, boo, big bass line, you know, I'm wondering, what's this? And I realize it's my friend's father's having a, a party in the house, which is called a blues party, you know, because when my parents and the black people came, the so-called Windrush generation came, there was a lot of racism at the time. So, they love music. So when they went to go to um, the clubs, you find that they weren't allowed in the clubs, you know? So they had to make their own entertainment. So they have the house and the sound system is a vibe from Jamaica, you know? They know the sound system vibe with the big speakers and the, the amplifiers and the heavy bass line, you know? So they got them in the house. So every Saturday night, you have a blues party. So I used to hear this blues party every Saturday night. And I said to my friend, when we get older, we have to have a sound, you know? The vibes were so nice, we have to have a sound. And by the grace of the Most High, my friend's father passed down the sound to him. That sound was called Lord Barley. And he passed it down to his son, and we all joined the sound, and we called it Exodus Sound, because at that time, we were Rasta youths in, in England. I was born in a place called Dulwich in London. Um, and my parents came from Jamaica. I am the um, second to last of a family of eight children. I'm the only girl. So I have seven big older brothers and one younger. Music in my household, most definitely. That's all I ever heard. A mixture of music. Um, and I remember the music to this very day. Every, you know, every song, most of the songs that I heard growing up, it, it always takes me back to a place, you know, or a time in my life back then, you know, all different types of music, reggae, pop, you know, soul, you know, um, music was the highlight of our house, definitely. There was always a piano in, in, the, in the piano room, a big brown dusty piano. And I remember always passing the piano and hearing clink, clink, clink on it and wondering, I wonder what that does. And obviously through curiosity, we would go into the room and just clink our fingers on the on the um on the notes and that's what I, that's my first memory of a piano was just going in and using my one finger and doing this i was born in south london um at dulwich hospital in um i guess it's kind of south east london um i was born there in um the 7th of june 1965 um, My parents came from a place called Trelawney in Jamaica, not too far from a place called Christiana, up in the mountains of Jamaica. Um, so yeah, they, they came from Trelawney, same, same area as Hussein Bolt, the, um, the famous Jamaican sprinter. Well, my dad was a sound person, you know, so he had a sound system. His sound system was called Musical Messiah. So the music, for me was a blessing because my dad the two rooms that we had when when we left Dulwich my dad moved to Coal Arbor Lane yeah so it's off Coal Arbor Lane East Lake Road and 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 in that shop 
he had his greengrocers and then we lived on top of the shop. And then in the basement, there were two rooms. So my dad used to play you, Roy. That's who I fell in love with first, was Daddy you, Roy. And then obviously you had Dennis Al Capone, Big U, Trinity, Tapazuki, you know, all of these, um, I, Roy, again, especially um, those MCs. I fell in love with that side of the reggae music. And then obviously my favorite singer of all time is Dennis Brown. And then the cool ruler is, um, was my sister's favorite singer. So we used to have competition. You know, we used to go one for one and play Dennis. I used to play playing Dennis Brown. She used to be playing Gregory and whatever. And then obviously, you know, you got the, the Abyssinians, the cultures, the, the, you know, the Bob Marley and the Whalers, of course, and, and people like that. But I just fell in love with the DJ side. But then obviously my parents being from the Caribbean, there was a country in Western influence so we had people like jim jim reeves you know kenny rogers all these all these guys because that's the type of music they used to on the radio in jamaica you know they used to play a lot of these guys so my dad used to brought those tunes with him from the caribbean also We had the sound system and it was called Exodus Sound. So at first, I was just glad to be in a sound system. It was a joy to go to the record shop, buy vinyl records, stand in the record shop all day, buying music. It was a joy to just be in the back of the van. It was a joy to just carry the boxes, you know? All these was like, it was like a community for us, you know? We became, we became carpenters, can we make some box? We became electricians, because we have to wire up the sound, you know. It was just great. But at home, I had this gram, this like record player. And it had a little microphone on it, you know. And sometimes I used to use the headphones. I know people don't know that, but if you speak to the headphones, you can get the sound like a microphone. So that was my first microphone, like the headphones. And I used to copy like some of the great uh, reggae DJs of the time, like Big Youth. And I Rai, you know, one of my personal favorites, because I love his lyrics, you know. I Rai and some of them, you know. But I was kind of shy. I wouldn't do it in public, you know, so I just do it at home, you know. But one day we were playing in a, in a youth club and we string up the sound and everybody says, we're going to get something to eat. Maka, you watch the sound. So I said, all right, I'll watch the sound. So them gone and the sound's there and the microphone's there and nobody's there and I'm shy, you know, so. We just pick up the microphone and start chat a couple of lyrics and I didn't realize they hadn't gone yet. And they spin around and run back in and say, who oh, that? I say, I mean, they say, boy, we never know you could chat like that. You have to start chatting the sound from now. So that's how I started to chat on the sound. But first, I was just what you call a pirate, you know? I just used to copy some of the greats, you know? But for some reason, I decided to make a lyrics for myself. And when I performed that lyrics in a dance, the people went crazy. I did. Um, we formed, well, I formed a group in my school called um, Love and Unity. It was myself and two other girls. And um, we would practice in, at home, at my, in, my, in our piano room at home. And I would, you know, between going to school and staying at home, I'd be writing songs constantly. I always wrote songs constantly. You know, I did that more than anything else, just writing songs depending on, you know, about different situations, not necessarily my personal experiences, but just how I saw life, you know, what was happening around me. I wrote songs to those, what was happening around me. Like, I Adore You, that was something that was happening around me, but it wasn't, it, you know, my sort of personal experience. You know, people say, were you in love at 14? I was saying, well, no, you know, I just know, I know the guy in the, down the road was in love with that girl, and I wrote about it, you know. So um, from playing the piano to recording, you know, we just, the songs were coming rapidly and then we saw an advert in the newspaper to perform at um, like a, a talent contest and we just applied. Just three little girls, 14 year olds, 15 year olds decided to, to apply and um, we entered the competition and we won the competition and the prize was to actually record the very first song, I Adore You. you know? Lovers Rock was a type of music that brung young people that brought young people 
like myself at the time together. It was a, it was it was the coming together of young couples. You know, as young teenagers, we often dream about the first boyfriend, and we experienced first love and um, puppy love and th feelings that we never understood and we called it love and probably it wasn't even love. So we just involved all the nice glossy summary feelings of love and um, all the negative things about love wasn't, we didn't include. So it was all, you know, we could have been going through something really bad in a relationship, but we ignored that and just focused on love and being happy. And that's for me, that was love as rock, you know, um, being in love and you know, you've got your boyfriend and he knows he's got his girlfriend and you know, just the beginnings of young love. You just practice in front of the mirror. You go, my dad had the, 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 the sound downstairs. So sometimes when he was out, I would go down and sneak down and switch on. And then you just go and you start practicing on a mic until people start saying you're good. Then you just go out there. And then when people, the test is when you, you got the people right in front of you that don't know you, that don't, you know, they don't know you. So they've got no obligation to you. It's not your sister. It's not your cousin there's complete strangers so then when you start saying that say yo that brother you're good you know and yeah it just kind of moved from there it was saloid it was saloid i mean saloid I, I was 17 when i did my first recording so saloid obviously saw my talent because i used to go to his dance and and smash the place to pieces so i think he had drummy zeb and tony gad from aswad they built a tune for a guy called Tokes who did a tune called My Valentine, I Want to Make You Mine when I was 17. And they and he called me to go on the B-side. So I went to the studio and I fell asleep. And then they woke me up. I was, you know, woke up and it was Drummy Zeb, you know what I mean? From as well, he said, are you a time now, you know? I said, oh, okay. So I just woke up, went in there and I just vocaled the tune. Didn't take me long. And then I just left it at that. And then the, that's when my recording career started to, to take off. I think Mandela was visiting Jamaica, but I wasn't booked for that one. When they heard that I was there, they said, Maccabee wanted you to sing in front of Mandela because I had a big song called Proud of Mandela. And it was mashing up Jamaica and the whole world, you know, even in you know, South Africa and love the song and everything. So what I had to do, I tell him, no, I'm going back to, to UK on that day. I said, what you can do is, because it's in the afternoon, perform in front of Mandela, then you can go and catch your flight. So that's what I did. I performed in front of Mandela, did the proud of Mandela crow go, go wild, and then left straight and went to the hotel and then to the airport, you know? Well, at that time, I didn't know what success in the industry was. So I was just like a lamb following the rest of the lambs that was there at the time. I didn't know what success was. I knew that I sung a song and it was at number one. I didn't know what that meant. I just thought, oh, number one, that means my song was great. And that was it. Business side, totally zero. Didn't know what was going on. I just enjoyed the fact that, yes, my song is number one in the charts. And um, that was it. I didn't know how big I was back in, the, back in that time because we was only kids. You know, um, and I couldn't understand why almost every song that I sang was like top 10, in the top 10 chart. Did you know your songs in the top 10? I thought, really? Wow. You know what I mean? So um, the successes at that time was, was, was unknown to me. I only really realized that now what it was, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah because, and, and at the time, more importantly, there wasn't that many black people on TV. So it's like, there's a black guy on TV. Oh, Tip was gonna be on TV. So it was a big thing within the community because there wasn't a lot of us that were on TV period. So it was a, a, a amazing achievement to come from where I came from to actually end up pretty similar to Janet Kay. You know what I mean? It's like, you write a song, Dennis Bovell wrote the song, gave it to this young girl to sing. And the next thing you know, it's number one in the pop chart. So Hello Darling was a similar story. Same for Smiley Culture with Police Officer, similar kind of thing. Under 
underestimate the the vibe that the Caribbean has brought to the UK, you know. And even just um, it's brought like a, a like a happier mentality, you know. Cause it's made people who cause when we first come, as you said, there's a lot of racism, you know. And we had to break that down, you know. And people know, you know, they live more in harmony. You're not saying it's st it's still there like institutionally, you know, but amongst the people them, you know, it's, it's, it's less and less and less and less. So it's brought more of an harmony, more of an awareness, more of an acceptance of other people's cultures, you know. And you can see it with even the, the food as well, you know. People are eating different kind of things, you know, the Caribbean and, you know, when you see reggae dances, you see everybody there, you know, full giant in the reggae music, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a great thing, you know. As artists, we all tick in different ways. You know, Mac, um, Maccabee ticks differently to how Carol Thompson ticks differently. I will tick differently um, in our approach to deliver the music. We all tick differently. But at the end of the day, we're all still one. It's just one. We come under the same roof. And that's what's amazing about British lovers rock, you know, and British reggae music, you know. And no matter where you go, whether it be in India, you have the reggae rajas, in, in Thailand, you have Gap, Gappy and T-Bone, they're into Ska, and all of these places where you go around the world. I, you know, I've been to Vietnam, I've been to Cambodia, I've been to the Philippines, all these Asia places, and then I've been to China, um, Shanghai and Hong Kong, and the music is just worldwide. And so there is space for, for us to, you know, to explore. And the music has done that, and reggae has done that for me, personally, anyway. Mommy say we contribute a lot to this society. Give the place vibes and we give it no variety. Come clean it up, show them both hospitality. Give the place life, Caribbean vitality. My ball, after the war, England did mash up. So them send few appearance, we come build it up. Send message to the islands, they come and help us. So they come from Jamaica, upon the wind rush. The first thing they noticed was the difference in our heat. Them frightened when them see the snow and the sleet. Them say gold up on the street, but my mama never see it appear. Dark doo doo, she say on the concrete gone abroad.